chapter 1. I want to read the entire chapter this morning, and I want you to just uh, kind of hear my heart today, and uh, we're going to have some just uh, family time today. The Bible says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel before the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with affliction of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ." And most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my change, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from self-ambition, but not sincerely, uh, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice." For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness. As always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this will mean I fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now hear in me. I uh, came across this message, or God laid this message on my heart probably two months ago, Uh, as I was doing some reading, just personal study through the book of Philippians. And uh, as I was reading, I thought, you know, those would be some good words to say. Uh, As Paul, as common with some of Paul's letters, kind of his closing remarks many times are at the beginning of the letter, and then he begins with his theology and and his challenge at the end. Uh, Back in those days, they would a lot of times write letters in kind of a backward order. They would, like I said, put the personal stuff at the beginning and then lay the theology and then the challenge and then just close the letter. But uh, uh, one exception to that would be the book of Romans. But this is kind of a, the way this is laid out. In fact, you, how we sign our names at the end of a letter, uh, they always sign their names at the beginning of the letter, hence verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Jerusalem. So you knew who this was from before you even knew who it was going to. And uh, as I read this and Paul's uh, very personal remarks to the church in Philippi, he loved this church, he cared for this church, he, he, uh, 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 he had good times and good relationships with this church. I just uh, I thought this would be some good things to say as I, and I don't know what else to call this, I titled the message A Final Challenge. Uh, you could say this is my goodbye message. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it this morning, uh, but I've just pulled some thoughts out of this. I could probably pull a whole lot more than what I'll do today, but I don't want to be here till till 2 or 3 o'clock, all right? So uh, let me just uh, share some of the thoughts on, the, on this passage. Here we go. In verse 3 through 5, I want to read them again. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. 
The first thing that I, that I just jumped out at me as Paul was saying this is that Paul always had good memories of this church in Philippi. Uh, you will never read of any conflict in this church. You'll never read of anything where Paul was disagreeing with the church or correcting them on a lot of teaching. He wasn't doing that. Uh, maybe some minor stuff, but nothing like the church in Corinth or some of the other churches that he had to write to. Uh, and uh, uh, I just kind of want to start with this morning by saying that Brent and I will leave here with many, many fond memories that we will take away for a lifetime. Um, and it's not the activities that were done. It's not the fun times. It's not all the craziness that we did in Awana. And we did a lot of craziness in Awana. Uh, last few years, we've done some uh, uh, insane things, okay? The ice cream night and the glow-in-the-dark night and some of those fun things we did. But that's not really the, the memories that we're going to take and, and that will stick in our minds for, for years. In fact, I was even thinking about this, that, that, uh, uh, that even the churches we've come from before this one, a uh, church in California and our church in Arkansas and those kinds of things, um, what really stands out this, uh, at us there is not even the, the memories necessarily, the things that took place and the moves and the, getting the buildings and stuff like that. It always goes back to those people whose lives that we saw come to Jesus Christ and then who followed Him in baptism. And that has always been what has, 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 remind, has been the thing that has, has kept us going. In fact, I remember the first convert that we still had uh, at the church, first church we ever planted in Arkansas was a, was a kid by the name of Michael. Michael Hines was his name. And uh, Michael was about a 14, 15, 16-year-old boy who trusted Christ. And, you know, I can't really tell you anything Michael did after that, and, and I really don't remember much about him after that, but I do remember this. He was the first young man who, who uh, came forward during one of our church services, and we were meeting in a, in a, uh, a um, clubhouse of a, of a, with a swimming pool right outside the back in this clubhouse, and, and we built walls and brought these walls in. And, and uh, about eight or nine weeks or so into this brand-new church we started, Michael came forward, and he accepted Christ. And, and, uh, and that's what I'll always remember about Michael. I do remember when he was baptized, he was really scared of water. <laughs> in fact, he said, he said, Preacher, we've got a problem. I said, what's that? And he said, I don't like water. I'm scared to death of water. I said, well, Michael, I said, you know, I've only lost two or three while baptizing, so don't worry about it. No, I didn't tell him that, but I said, uh, I said, you know, I, I'll get you through this. Really, you just hang on to me. You hang on really tight, and, and I'll make sure I don't lose you. And uh, he said, well, is it very deep? And I said, well, no, it's not too deep. I said, don't worry. It's probably about chest high. And, and uh, he said, well, I really don't like putting my face underwater. I said, really, Michael? And so I, I showed them the thing that I've showed all of you that I've baptized, you know, how that, you know, you grab my hand, you grab your own nose, and he liked that, and, you know, he didn't, so, because he was afraid he'd have to go underwater without grabbing his nose. I showed him how to do that. And uh, we baptized Michael, and, and, and he got through it. He survived, and, and he didn't even have a panic attack or nothing like that. And, and uh, you know, I got to, I was doing some counting uh, last week, and uh, just kind of uh, as best I can count, uh, I've had the wonderful joy of baptizing. Uh, about 19 or 20 of you who still attend this church regularly and faithfully who come and counting some of our Awana kids. And uh, you don't know what a joy and a blessing that has been. And you don't know what a joy and a blessing that is to, to take with us. Uh, that's that's going to be always the, the greatest memory. Nothing brings joy to a pastor's heart and a pastor's family more than that. And while the movie nights have been fun, the retreat with the men was, was a great time, uh, the joys of camp, Nothing compares with seeing others come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and following Him in believer's baptism. Uh, but folks, we, you know, the thing is, the truth is, we don't live in the past, do we? You know, uh, somebody once said, the past is the past. That's, that's pretty deep, isn't it? You know, uh, but the past is the past. You can't do anything about the past. You can't change the past. It's what it is. But we can live for the future. Okay. In fact, people who are trying to always live in the past and try to fix the past and all that are usually very miserable people. And we have to move towards the future. Uh, what we've accomplished and what we've used to uh, do for God means nothing. What is important is the work that God still has to do for Clear, Clear Creek. And that's what I, I kind of got as verse 6, as I read in verse 6, where he says, And being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. And folks, I'm here to tell you this morning that God is not done with Clear Creek, okay? He is not finished. He has more to do, okay? And you are part of that plan, okay? And uh, my prayer is that you certainly don't leave here this morning or the next week or whenever and say, well, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? You know, we, uh, you know, we've put together a plan. We've got a plan. The, the plan is moving forward, and that's good, and God is still blessing, and God is, has been giving our pulpit committee names and things like that. Listen, God is not done with this church. Uh, no more than God has done with your life, okay? Just because the pastor and his wife uh, 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 leave this ministry and go to a different ministry doesn't mean that God has died, 
Okay? And now some of you think that. All right? So, oh, my goodness gracious, you know, can God really pull this off? Listen, he's so much bigger than, than, than Brenda or I, it's, it's not even funny. Okay? And if this church is built upon us and our personality, then this is a weak church anyway. Okay? And I've said that many times from this pulpit. It is built on you and your strength and your, your strong faith. That is what builds any church is, is the people. Paul knew that long after his death, long after his time was finished, God still had much work to do in the church in Philippi. And just as the work that wasn't done in Philip or uh, just as the work um, uh, was that was done in Philippi, there's st- there's still work to be done in this city and in this neighborhood and at your work and among your loved ones. Uh, if you decide someday to quit and give up, then you choose to not to seek the work to do what God has said he will complete in you. Uh, if you decide to close the doors of this church someday, then what you're deciding to do is to miss out on the blessings of the next chapter that God has for this church. Listen, folks, I don't know, maybe you've never thought of it this way, okay, but I want you to look around for just a second. Look at everybody around you, okay? Everybody looking around? You say, yep, I've seen all these people before, preacher. Okay, good. Uh, Whether you realize or not, this is a young church, okay? This is a young church. Uh, In fact, I was thinking about next week, for Father's Day, um, I, I may win oldest father, okay? And uh, so I've got to invite some older gentleman to come with me next week, okay? So, Robert, are you older than me? Oh, praise Jesus. Okay, we're in good shape then, so all right. But, I mean, Robert is, Robert is 54. I mean, 54 is young, okay? 54 is not used up and, and unable to do anything. I mean, 54, most churches that you go into, when you talk about the church being an old church, you know, I've had people say, well, that church is an old church. They've got nothing but old people in the church. And what are they saying? They're saying, well, these people are all over 70, they're all over 80, you know, whatever it might be. And, and folks, this is not an old church, okay? This is a young church by comparison to a lot of churches. Now you say, well, Brother Jeff, we used to be younger. Well, I'll grant you that one, okay? But, uh, but, and you've gotten older, but you are certainly not done being used by God, okay? And none of you are. In fact, uh, I've told you before about uh, Bill Mathis, a friend of mine I had in Bible college, who was 70 years old, surrendered to preach, and went to Bible college and got his degree and went off and, and to start a church in his hometown. And I told you about my sister-in-law's father who, who at the age of uh, 70 years old uh, uh, retired from his job and after he retired from his job went off to Bible college to get his degree so he could go back and plant a church in his hometown and a church that as far as I know is still going today. Listen, you're not too old to do something great for God. Uh, every one of you in this room could surrender to be a missionary on the mission field. You say, oh, Brother Jeff, goodness gracious, I couldn't do that. Actually, you're probably in a better place to do that than a young couple who's come out of college with a lot of college debt where some of you have retirement built up and things like that and, and monies that you could use to actually go to the field and not be a burden to churches and other people. And you can do that if God has called you to do it. I'm just saying this is not an old church. There is a lot of work still to be done and can be done. You say, Brother Jeff, I feel like I'm 100. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel like, okay? <laughs> it's, it's what you are, okay? And a lot of times it's, it's working through that and just doing as God has blessed you. Um, each one of you here are families that can support and rally behind a young pastor. Um, you are so far ahead of the game when it comes to, to normal churches. Many times when a pastor comes to take a church, he's taking a church that, that's struggling. He's taking a church where there's been some fighting and arguing going on. He's taking a church where there's been a split. He's taking a church where uh, um, the pastor was run off or something like that. Or maybe he's taking a church where the pastor just kind of up and said, you know, well, y'all voted for blue carpet and I wanted red carpet, so I'll just quit. Okay. Before you laugh, I actually knew a church where that happened. Okay. Uh, they had a big vote on the church. The church voted for red carpet. The pastor wanted blue carpet, and so he just quit and resigned. Left two weeks later and disappeared. And uh, you know, I've, you know, we haven't had any of that craziness go on here. Okay, none of that. And, and, and you're right, Mark. Praise God that we haven't had that. And uh, and because of that, you guys are so far ahead of the ballgame in most churches when they're calling a pastor. Okay. And he can come in, and you can love on him, and you can support him, and you can say, Preacher, what do you need me to do? And he may go, you know, I don't even know. I'm kind of overwhelmed. I'm still just needing some help trying to figure out how to move in. I say, well, great. We can rally a group of people together, and we'll help you move in. And then what do you need? I don't know. How do I get to Walmart? We can tell you how to get to Walmart. Okay, whatever it takes, you know, you can step in and help this young pastor because they'll need that, okay, especially for a while there. They'll still be trying to figure out what's going on and where they're going and what they're doing. But to make it your mission to come together in unity, strive to work hard, and God can still do great things. But one of the key things here is in verses 9 through 11, where he says, And this I pray that your love may abound. That's your next point. Love must abound. 
And how does it abound? I find this interesting. It must abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. I don't know about you, but I find that an interesting statement. Uh, How does love abound in knowledge? How does love abound in knowledge? Think about that for just a second. You know, we think about love being in this emotion and this thing we do and this thing, this ooey gooey feeling we get all over ourselves. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not what love is, okay? But the point being is that, you know, how does a love abound in knowledge? I mean, think about it. Love is this, love is this uh, you know, we think it's just this thing we fall into or all these feelings and emotions that we get. And that's not what love is at all. Love is a choice. And when we love something, we, we get involved in it. And we're to get in love it must abound in knowledge. And when we gain knowledge, we don't get this big head and we don't get all puffed up, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. It's not letting yourself think that you know more than somebody else does. And we also love and discernment by being wise and discerning matters. Uh, the pulpit committee needs discernment as they call men and they present men to this congregation. And you need to use loving discernment as you vote together on a family. And, and, and you will need to be discerning as you work with them to get to know them and love on them and support them. He goes on and says in this, in verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to every glory, to the glory and praise of God. Uh, some words that just jump out at me there. He says that you approve the things that are excellent. It just means that you do things when they're done right. You, you, you honor and you glorify and you thank God for those things that are right. Uh, when things are done wrong, then you deal with those things. But uh, you don't settle for second best in your service for God. Okay, now is not the time to say, well, you know, we'll just kind of coast on by and do kind of a lackadaisical, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of uh, fake our way through Awana. We're getting good at it. You know, no, no, now is the time to do things with excellence. Do them better than anybody else does them. Do it all for the glory and honor of God. Uh, we're commanded in Scripture to do all things decently and in order. Do them right. Do them properly. In verse 10, he says uh, he wants them to be sincere. That's a genuineness, a love, nothing hidden, not manipulative. Love and care for one another. And he says, and while you're doing all this, don't get offended. Don't get offended. Um, you know, we, we live in a world of getting offended. Okay, people love to, in fact, not only, not only do we get offended, but we also just sue right along with it, you know, okay? Um, you know, we all heard the story about the lady, you know, spilled the coffee on herself when, at McDonald's, you know, and sued for and got millions of dollars. Okay, we, we live in a dumb world, okay? You know, people get offended by it. Well, you know, uh, uh, they did put my name in the bulletin or they didn't put my name in the bulletin, okay? You know, uh, what, what are they doing doing that stuff for? I didn't give them permission to put my name in the bulletin, and then they do something, and they didn't put my name in the bulletin. You know, we get offended by all kinds of crazy things, okay? Uh, pretty soon the Chiefs are going to have to name the rename the team. Okay, I don't know what we'll become. I don't know the Kansas City Kansas City Cityans or something like that. And I'll just keep everybody happy and pleased, you know, but then somebody in the, out in the farms will be offended. Well, how come they call them the Cityans and not the farmers? Okay. You know, it's just a dumb world we live in. And, you know, you can get offended easily if you want to. If you want to find something to get offended by, it won't take very long to do it. And I'm sure that I've offended some of you, and, and uh, 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 you know, and, and if I have, I will apologize for that. Um, your new pastor is going to come in. He's going to offend some of you, Okay. Uh, one, he won't know all of you. He'll forget your names, okay? In fact, he'll say, you know, that lady in the church, she told me her name, and by golly, I can't remember where it was, and I wrote it down. Now I can't where I wrote it down because it's somewhere there and in the new mortgage papers, and, and I don't know. And, and uh, you know, he may have to ask you your name four, five, six times. Don't get offended by that, okay? He may not have a photographic memory, okay? He may not know exactly what the, in fact, he's, like I said, he's probably still trying to figure out where Walmart's at, all right? And, and he's trying to figure out what school to get his kids into, and all those different kinds of things that will be going on. And, and, and so don't get offended. Don't get offended easily. Uh, this is no time to be offended in the church. He's going to say some things that I would say differently. Okay? Uh, he may have a bigger sense of humor than, than I've got. Maybe he doesn't have as much a sense of humor I've got. Maybe he doesn't have a sense of humor. Okay? Uh, you know, uh, don't make that a qualification as, as to be the pastor. Okay? Uh, he may have a different kind of sense of humor. Okay, uh, he may sing, he may not sing. His wife may play piano, she may not play piano. Okay, uh, she might have blue, blue hair, blonde hair, green hair, purple hair. I don't know. Okay, but but don't be offended by those kinds of things. Okay, this is not the time. Now's the time to work together. Uh, don't get offended if he parks in your parking spot. You know, 
Uh, I was noticing that again this morning. Not only we as Christians, we've gotten comfortable with our spot in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the church where we sit, okay? And I can promise you his family will probably come in and sit in one of your spots, all right? So uh, if they don't sit on the front row, they're going to be in trouble because they're going to get your spot. And uh, so don't get offended by that. But, but uh, you know, I, I was looking at the parking lot this morning. I'm going, okay, I can pretty much tell where Mark's going to park every week. I know where I'm going to park every week. And uh, I know where Troy Mishan is going to park every week. And it's like... Aren't we just creatures of habit? It's so funny, you know. And he might take your spot, okay? I'm just warning you now. He might get it, and don't be offended by that. Don't put pressure on his kids to be perfect. They won't be, and they aren't, okay? You know, I've never talked about this much in this church because uh, it's not really been needful to talk about it here because our boys were grown, and when we came here, our boys had already uh, graduated high school and gone on to uh, college and things like that. So you all didn't really grow up around our kids. You really don't know our boys that well. Uh, and be quite honest, when they come here, they feel a little out of sorts because they're like, you know, brother, you know, mom and dad know all these people that we've never known and never grown up with. But uh, I will tell you this. Allow his kids to be your kids and don't expect any more out of his kids than you expect out of your own kids, okay? Uh, you know, if you don't expect your kids to finish an Awana handbook, don't expect his kids to finish the Awana handbook, okay? Because his kids are kids just like everybody else's kids, all right? Uh, just because they're the preacher's kids doesn't mean that they're perfect, okay? And they're not going to act better than your kids, okay? Well, the preacher's kids should act this way. Well, who says? Now, what, what kind of, that, that's not fair to him, okay, or, or to them, I mean, or to him, the pastor, I have to expect his kids to be better or different or excel greater. Well, they should get straight A's in school. I mean, they're the preacher's kids. I'll never forget this one time. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, we were parents who encouraged our kids to work in their Awana books, but we didn't, we didn't beat them to make them get through their Awana books, okay, when they were growing up. But uh, I'll never forget when uh, one year after we'd had the Bible quiz, I think it was the second year that Brad came home and he said, by golly, I'm going to win that Bible quiz this year. And uh, as we got a close around the Bible quiz, Brad worked and 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 uh, did really, really well. And back in those days during Bible quizzing, at the end of the Bible, Bible quiz, they would have an, uh, the uh, top clubber. It was the kid who'd scored the most points uh, for that particular club, okay? And then, then I think they had a tiebreaker type of deal. Anyway, uh, Brad won clubber of the year. Or not clubber of the year. That's not what we call it. Uh, he won top clubber. He quizzed out. and He, he got top clubber. He scored the most points uh, of the boys his age in, in, in Awana. And uh, I'll never forget that day, kind of like what we've done here. We had the kids come, and they brought their awards, and they did all this stuff. And uh, we got ready to, uh, I presented him and I said, and Brad worked really hard and he, he got top club at the quiz. And one of the ladies in the church, and she said it loud enough for everybody else to hear, she said, well, he ought to, he's the preacher's kid, you know. And I thought, what I thought and what I said were two different things. I didn't say anything, but I thought, you knucklehead, that's what I thought. I'll put that in my book of things I'd like to say someday but can't, okay, because you're a preacher. But I thought, what a knucklehead, you know. Uh, why should he be expected to win top clubber? And none of the other kids were expected to, or forced to, or made to. Okay, and we, and we didn't force him. We didn't make him. Okay, uh, that was something he wanted to do, and he worked hard. And uh, and I don't know if he was offended by it or hurt by it, but but you know, had he known exactly what he was saying. But you know, don't expect more from his kids. Uh, what's the goal? What's the goal of this church from here on out? What should be the goal? I think verse twelve ought to be your your cry, your slogan, your your go to phrase. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out. For the furtherance of the gospel. That ought to be your goal in everything that you do from here on out. The furtherance of the gospel. Wherever Paul went, whatever he did, his goal was to further the gospel of Christ. Whether good or bad, whether in prison or free, whether being shipwrecked or preaching in the synagogue, Paul always preached the gospel. Now, one thing that you have to realize is that even though we are leaving, we're getting a new ministry, uh, the goal of our ministry that we're going to start will be the, the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, that's our goal. That's our plan, to tell more people about Jesus Christ and win them to Christ. Uh, it's adding one more ministry out into a world that needs to be ministered to. It's one more way to share Christ. And by the way, just in case you wonder if everybody who comes to us for counseling and help is a Christian, uh, we're actually working with a family right now who, who he's unsaved. And he, he admitted it the first week there. In fact, on his, uh, we do this little information form we usually give to most folks. And he wrote on this, says, are you Christian? He said, no. You know, uh, very clearly, very clearly, I'm not a Christian. And the first week he was there, I talked to him about it. He said, I've got no interest in being a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. Okay, you know, and so, uh, and, and you know, say, what's your goal with him in counseling? My goal is to win him to Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> you know, this guy's 
locked up with me for an hour every week, stuck in the, our basement, okay, of our house. And, you know, so he's going to get preached to, you know, whether he likes it or not. He's going to get nailed a few times. And, and we do that. I, I talk to him about Christ and why hasn't he trusted Christ? And I'm trying to figure out all the reasons why. And so, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's part of our ministry. It's what we will be doing. And it's going to be a very difficult case. And I would say to you that whatever you do in this church, the purpose of it is to further the gospel of Christ. I don't care if it's a movie night. I don't care if it's a youth camp. I don't care if it's taking teens bowling. I don't care if it's a picking on the parking lot. Okay? The goal must be the furtherance of the gospel of Christ. You say, Brother Jeff, are we going to preach at the picking on the parking lot? No. Or, Brother Jeff, what are we going to do? What you're going to do, in fact, if I see you doing this, I'll probably, I'm going to, I'm going to be really ornery, okay, on, on Saturday night. If I see you sitting by a bunch of church members and I see people that we don't know and nobody's talking to them, okay, uh, I'm going to shoo you over there. I'm going to say, hey, Robert and Sheila, I need you guys to go sit with that family over there. Go meet them, okay? Invite them to church next week. Find out what their church background is, okay? That's what I'm going to do. Uh, if Dan, Mark and Daniel are sitting there talking to Brenda, I'm going to say, oh, Mark and Daniel, I want you guys. Of course, you'll be running to get hot dogs. But, you know, if you see that, I'm going to run them over and say, hey, there's a family over there. Nobody's talking to them, okay? Now, if you think this is crazy, by the way, this is what, uh, this is what they do on, on our job where I work. Uh, we have these big community things and community-wide things, and we come and our staff comes, and if staff is standing around talking, they come by and say, hey, you guys want me to be talking? You got 364 days out of the year to be talking. Go talk to them, okay? We're going to get three hours to tell people how great our church is and how great our Christ is, and we're going to sing some songs that honor and lift up the name of Jesus Christ, and we get three hours out of them. Maybe not even that because they may not stay that long. They may come, get their hot dog, their snow cone, and bail, okay? But uh, that's one of the reasons why we're doing the door prizes. We get names and addresses and, and, and people that can be followed up that you can follow up, a new pastor can follow up, and everybody can follow up. You know, so we can, we can find out what's, you know, how these people hear about us. Why are they looking for a church? Uh, this would be a great place to worship. Uh, it's the furtherance of the gospel. It's the whole purpose of everything. Next, I just, uh, in verse 14, jumped out at me, and we see the word through this passage many, many times. Most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear. It means boldness. You've got to be bold, okay? Uh, this is not the time for timidity. Actually, we don't live in a day and age in Christianity. It's time to be timid. Okay? It's time to be bold. It's time to share our faith. It, it's time to quit hiding that we're Christians. Okay? Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How come, Paul? Why aren't you ashamed? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is still what changes lives. Listen, I love the Awana program. Okay? But we've never had a boy or girl get saved after having Awana games. Okay? After they ate some ice cream flavor they didn't like and it was really gross to them, they didn't say, wow, that's really great. Can I accept Jesus now? It's never happened. Okay. Now, the games got them here, okay, and they came for Glow in the Dark Night, and they came for this night and that night and Crazy Hatter Night and Deck Dynasty Night and all the other crazy things. That got them here, but that's not what brings them to Jesus Christ. What brings them to Jesus Christ is as they read the Word of God and they study it and they ask you leaders the questions and you begin to explain to them the Scriptures and what's going on. And they hear a Bible message afterwards and they say, listen, I need to receive Christ. I need to receive Christ. It's not the movie nights, even though some of the movies have great messages, but, but, that's, but, you know, but, but uh, uh, it's not feeding the hungry. It's not giving away clothing. It's not donating toilet paper to the City Union Mission. All those things are great, but that's not what changes lives, folks. What changes lives is still the gospel of Jesus Christ. All those things are good, but never make them substitutes for the gospel. Share it boldly. Any visitor who comes to this church should know that the most important thing in this church is that people come to Jesus Christ and that they will come here and hear the message of Christ. And by the way, if you think every church on the planet is like that, you're wrong. Okay? Uh, you can go to a lot of churches today and you can sit through their services and you'll never hear, never hear the message of Jesus Christ. You'll never be given an opportunity to receive Christ. You'll never have an opportunity to trust in Him as your Savior. Uh, many, many churches like that. There's a whole lot more I could say in, in, in these other verses, but I'm going to jump down to verse 26. Where Paul says that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. I'm just going to ask you that as we leave this church that you rejoice with us. Okay? I hope you're not mad at us. Okay? So far nobody's kicked us in the shins as we've, as we've stood at the back. Okay? Uh, nobody stepped on our toe. Uh, nobody's, you know, probably the worst thing that's ever happened to us since we've been here was when Sheila McCallum dumped the uh, bucket of water over my head like the first or second week I was pastor, okay? So that's, that's probably like the worst thing that's ever happened to us here. So, no, uh, you know, and uh, by the way, I haven't forgotten, so watch out Saturday night. No, I'm just kidding, but, um, um, you know, I hope you'll just rejoice with us. Rejoice with us that God is using us in a way that He has called us to do and that we're going to go do that. 
Listen, you may not understand all the reasons for our leaving. Okay, I'll be quite honest with you. I don't understand all the reasons for it. Okay, I don't know why God moves and directs. I didn't understand it when God picked us up from California and moved us to Arkansas of all places. Uh, you talk about culture shock. And, uh, you know, I, did, I haven't understood, always understood every move that God has called us to do. I didn't understand when he called us out of our church in California to go plant one across town. And I didn't understand that. But God has always blessed. And we just ask that you rejoice with us, that you be happy for us, as we will be happy for you as you begin this new chapter in your life. Um, as I said before, if I have offended anyone, and anyone, and I'm sure I have, uh, I hope that we're leaving with all matters resolved. Um, I know that you've not always understood why we do things that we do in our family and in our home, and we haven't understood why you do some of the things that you do in your home and your family, okay? But we can still love God, and we can still serve Him together, and we can still work together. Um, I have always prayed uh, for peace in whatever God leads me to do. And I can tell you right now, I do have a complete peace about what we're doing and the timing is right and the, and the timing of this move. Um, if, it's any, if it's anything, it's probably later than it should have been. And we pray that you will rejoice with us as, as we rejoice with you. Okay, Which kind of leads me to my last point this morning, which Paul says in verse 27 28, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you, salvation, and that from God. Uh, our prayer is that we'll always hear good reports of Clear Creek Baptist Church. Uh, good reports. Reports that say, you know, hey, we had to add a, an extra service because we're packing out the building. You know, trust me, I'm not going to get jealous if that happens. I'm not going to say, well, gosh, what happened? What does it? Listen, uh, you know, I, I want to hear things like that. Uh, if you all have a revival meeting and 25 people get saved and you baptize 25 of them, that's more than I've done here in seven and a half years. Well, praise God. I hope that happens, okay? Uh, we want to hear good things. Our prayer will be, verse 4, always in every prayer, making requests for you with all joy. Uh, I hope that in a year's time you guys have outgrown this building. That's my prayer. Um, I hope that you have to go to double services. I hope that uh, uh, we've heard of several new families who have joined. I hope that we have heard of many of those people coming to Christ. I hope that we hear that you have, to re- that you have remained faithful and each person is serving somewhere in the church. I hope we ho- hear that you've made good inroads into the apartment complexes and the housing areas around this area. Um, I hope we hear that you've made, uh, you're sharing the gospel and that people have come to Christ. Uh, we, we want to hear things like when Jerry gets baptized, stuff like that, okay? Uh, these are things that we're looking forward to hearing about. Uh, and, and, of course, you have to remember we're not Facebook people, okay? So uh, uh, we'll probably get it fourth or fifth hand, all right? But uh, and we, that's not going to change, okay, anytime soon. I can promise you that. Um, it's funny. I was talking to somebody just the other day. I can't remember who I was even talking to now about but they said, I'm really starting to hate Facebook. Everything I do is public. And I say, yeah, no kidding. So, um, but, uh, you know, just, uh, so we're not that, but just, you know, we're only a phone call away. We're not even that far across the state line. And uh, we still love every one of you. Trust me, there won't be jealousy. It will bring joy to our hearts and confirmation that God is still on the throne and still in control and still at work in the hearts and lives of folks here at Clear Creek. And it will also confirm to us that we did the right thing and that God has called us to do the right thing. So with all that said, uh, we will be here next week uh, <laughs> for, for a good five message. This isn't our last Sunday, but I knew Father's Day would be more appropriate to bring something Father's Day-ish, okay? Um, but one of the things I did want to do one last time is to share the Lord's table with you. And uh, so this morning we're going to have communion and, uh, and, and, and fellowship together around the Lord's table and uh, rejoice in his suffering, in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. And uh, praise God that, that, uh, that we, can, we can do this as a body of believers in Jesus Christ. And so, um, so I'm going to ask our men to go ahead and come at this time. We're going to move into this portion of the service. Ask Rebecca to come, and she's going to play some music while we pass the elements this morning. Uh, give us just a moment here to set up and to... Um, kind of get situated here just a little bit.